Having been praised for the quality of my titles, I've entitled this talk, Harold John Ockengay. <laughs> Harold John Ockengay was born in 1905, and events in his birth year would later impact his formal studies and his future sermons. In 1905, Russia suffered a humiliating defeat by Japanese forces, providing intellectuals in Russia the second to last piece of ammunition that they needed to impose radical change on their own country and beyond. In 1905, the industrial workers of the world held their founding convention, and leaders of the Western Federation of Miners first took justice into their own hands to impose radical change in their own country by murdering the ex-governor of Idaho. Marxist movements and then communist realities would stoke the fears of conservative Americans that a communist threat was advancing abroad and at home. Harold John's own family lived far from these realities. His non-Christian father was a blue-collar worker without much education, but he was hardly a poster boy for a restless proletariat. He joined the Kiwanis Club. He lived in suburban Chicago, and he told his children to read good books. His devout mother, on the other hand, told him to do his duty, spend time in church, and pursue holiness. Not finding a, a decent Methodist church for her children, she did the next best thing and had Ockingay baptized and educated by Presbyterians. Although I realize for some of you that would be the third, maybe the fourth best thing. <laughs> this problem was soon fixed, and by his first communion, the boy was safely surrounded by Episcopalian Methodists. Well, Ockingay would one day be seen as J. Gresham Machen's greatest protege, but for both men, their mother's piety would forever impact their life and faith. And for Harold John, it meant a Wesleyan commitment to a second blessing and a Methodist mode of decision-making and guidance. Well, Ockingay would have a second blessing. In fact, he did a third and a fourth. Uh, his conversion experience came you know, predictably, at a, at a Methodist camp uh, at age 11. His first strong sense of assurance came at age 17. There would be other movements and moments that would be pivotal. Prayer meetings, services of worship, quiet moments of reflection, prayer, and then decision. It was Ockengay's college days that set the tone for the whole of his life. He felt and others confirmed that he was called to the ministry. And from that point forward, the whole of his life was oriented around this calling. He enrolled at Wesley and Taylor University and committed himself to constant preaching, exceptional piety, and unusual scholarship. Ockengay wanted to practice what he preached, but he also wanted to, to, to practice preaching. And he joined a college preaching team thing I've not heard of lately, uh, and, and he preached around the country. Uh, on the road, he gained good experience, but his colleagues and conflicts with them also helped him to see that his youthful arrogance was hindering his message and harming his brothers. God would change all that, and as he often does with us, he would sometimes do that in spite of, rather than because of, Ockengay's theology. His Wesleyan doctrine directed him to a quest for quantum leaps in holiness instead of the hard road of gradual sanctification. Tellingly, Ockengay spoke of his pride and sarcasm as a, as a thorn in the flesh for God to remove, less as a sin for him to crucify. That said, God could use Ockengay because even at a young age, he was a man of prayer. Muddled as his prayer petitions might sometimes have been, his pursuit of Christ was an earnest. It was personal, not professional. His letters reveal that, that he wanted the Spirit's work in hope of being a better Christian and not just a better preacher. And then mixed with his preaching and his piety was an unusual commitment to scholarship. Uh, unusual in those days, already in college, he became convinced that he needed further education, seminary, and then graduate degrees, and even a PhD. Well, his choice of seminary was Princeton, which brought him back into a Presbyterian orbit. 
Princeton had high academic standards, great Gothic buildings, and fantastic professors. But he arrived at the East at a difficult time. This was the era of the fundamentalist controversy, with preachers like Harry Emerson Fosdick and financiers like Rockefeller Jr. promoting a progressive religion. Eventually, J. Gresham Machen and others were removed from the ministry for insisting that missionaries and ministers believe as true history and orthodox doctrine that Christ was born of a virgin, performed miracles, died an atoning death, and lives today as the first to rise forever from the dead. When the majority of Princeton professors lost this battle with the progressive theologians, and I think we could add with the moderate theologians who supported them, Ockengay made a life-changing decision. He left his beloved Princeton Seminary and followed Machen to the newly formed Westminster Theological Seminary in Philadelphia. He chose present faithfulness over future prominence. For by now, Ockengay had made a mark as a student, and heading to Westminster required that he give up a scholarship to study in Europe. No small thing for a man of modest means. Well, both in college and seminary, Ockengay trained for his calling, not as a gentleman of leisure, but as a soldier heading to war. He saw hours of prayer, hard study, and frequent preaching as necessary if one wanted to graduate from seminary shaped by the word of God, ready to rightly divide the word of truth. But three other features of his seminary days are worthy of note. He spent time with men who were ahead of him in the faith. He sat under powerful preaching, and he did not permit for himself those little compromises with unfaithfulness that inject seams of clay into feet of iron. Seminary took Ockengay from Princeton to Philadelphia. Graduation took him from New Jersey to Pittsburgh. Ockengay had graduated seminary, still a Methodist somehow, But gone were the heady days when Methodists ordained anyone who could speak in complete sentences about Jesus. When the the big steeples chased the young seminarian, his local superintendent required him to serve two small churches instead. After all, he was young, he was a fundamentalist, and he was a follower of Machen. But Ockengay always wore his ecclesiological commitments lightly, and within a year, he headed her, he heeded a call to Pittsburgh with the great Presbyterian preacher of the day, Clarence McCartney. Both McCartney and Machen spoke at his ordination, and Ockengay was now the assistant pastor at a big church with no obvious job description, some of you may relate, and uh, with no Sunday preaching. And so he found his own work to do. He taught frequently in different contexts. He visited constantly, meeting in one year with almost all of the 3,000 members of the church. Not quite all, because as he pointed out to the pastors at year's end, 300 of them didn't really attend, and he recommended that they be removed from the church roles. It was earnest service. The Sunday school grew by leaps and bounds. And meanwhile, both men kept their ears open for other avenues of service for their young Ockengay. Well, the Lord did not yet require patience for their protege. His short stint with McCartney offered a powerful example of a faithful ministry, and he was soon called to be the pastor of Point Breeze Presbyterian Church, a prestigious call. McCartney supported the move, even though it would mean the loss of a wonderful, talented assistant. This second installation was accompanied with great fanfare. Nonetheless, the membership of the 1,300-member church was somewhat irregular in their attendance. In a letter to a friend, Dawkingay said that only 25 people showed up for the first service. Well, within a few years, many had returned to the church. 600 had been removed from the rolls. 250 new members were added. And the Sunday school grew to 600 people. He preached, he prayed, and he studied. 
While pastor of Point Breeze, he used his spare time uh, to, to earn a master's degree and then a PhD in a study of Marxism that would leave its mark on the whole of his ministry. But not all of his spare time, for it was here that he courted and married his beloved Audrey. He had earlier romances, but it was only with Audrey that he chose to abandon his previous and strangely unsuccessful approach of telling lucky ladies that they had met his 25-point requirement of what was needed to be his wife. <laughs> but Ockingay would not be known as a preacher of Pittsburgh, but a preacher of Boston. Hearing of the Reformation at Point Breeze and getting recommendations from McCartney and Machen, the people of the Congregationalist Park Street Church in Boston came calling. Uh, Ockingay was once again not very reflective on polity in this descent from Presbyterianism to Congregationalism, as he had been in his climb from Episcopalianism to Presbyterianism. Ockingay sought the Lord's will and felt himself drawn to this historic pulpit. His Presbyterian friends supported the move because they knew the importance of a continuing Orthodox voice in that Roman Catholic and Unitarian stronghold of Boston. Almost from his arrival in town, he had invitations from bigger and, I suppose, better churches in New York and California. A Presbyterian megachurch, there are such things, uh, in Seattle, uh, promised him an astonishing salary with a bevy of outsized benefits. And Park Street made no counteroffers. But prayers were being answered in Boston, and Auchengate chose to stay. True to his Methodist roots, he had come to the East longing for revival, wanting people and churches to be saved and sanctified in huge leaps. Revival was needed. And revival, he declared in 1950, is here. Revival, he said, is the solution to all our problems. New England had seen great revivals in the past, as you know. And from the Park Street pulpit, Ockingay told people about those stories. He awakened a hunger for greater things. And he acted, waiting to reach the lost, wanting to reach the lost. He, he preached in the Boston Commons until the police closed him down. With the park closed, a generous benefactor had an outdoor pulpit installed over the front doors of the church thus causing crowding on the street instead of the park. As a preacher of the word, Gay was always ready to identify as a fundamentalist this whole time in his current and core convictions. The, the, his, the commitment to gospel preaching itself was, as he saw it, fundamentalism's, fundamentalism's first strength. Its second was its commitment to orthodoxy. The best of Ockingay's messages made their way into print, and sound doctrine thus reached a wide readership. One book not birthed by biblical exposition was his Our Protestant Heritage. Here, Ockingay defended orthodoxy by arguing against church mergers taking place at the expense of doctrinal integrity, for important differences between churches were being ignored for the sake of institutional unity. And he defended doctrine by preaching against Roman Catholicism, often. But as he sought for every two strengths of fundamentalism, there were three weaknesses. First, fundamentalism was weak on social concerns. Alkingay wanted to do better. His sermons, broadcast by radio, regularly expounded the word of God and called sinners to a living faith in a living Christ. But Ockingay also discussed ethical issues, commented on societal woes, addressed political matters, and explained the evils of communism and Catholicism. While he would never lose his Methodist discomfort with drinking and smoking, he agreed with Carl Henry that fundamentalists were too exclusively concerned with matters of personal religion and personal piety. Of course, social critique and engagement was just the sort of thing that liberals also did. But Ockingay was determined that one could preach societal sin and personal sin. His national social impact was through the radio, in which matters of wider concern, again including communism, were frequently discussed. 
He sought local impact by serving as a trustee of any number of important Boston causes and institutions. And since he wouldn't do that work at the expense of his primary calling to be a pastor, he worked long days with countless meetings. His wife, Audrey, called herself a ministry widow. While present for breakfast, Gay would rarely return before bedtime. But they did have eight-week vacations together in their beloved New Hampshire each year, and she insisted that it was her privilege to sacrifice much in order to serve as a helper to such an extraordinary husband. Fundamentalism needed to do better in addressing social concerns. Second, fundamentalism was also to be chided for its lack of scholarship. While individuals were being saved, the, moment was, the movement was failing to impact the academic and political elite of America. Evangelist Billy Sunday had scorned the importance of European scholarship for the American church, explaining to his audiences that if you turned hell upside down, it would say, made in Germany on the bottom. <laughs> Ockengay did not share those concerns. He was convinced that fundamentalism would have limited impact if it did not touch the upper crust of society. He knew that the last fundamentalist to truly make an impact on the academy and the wider culture was Machen. And as one of his prized students, he wanted to change that. Third, while Ockengay opposed church mergers undermining orthodoxy, he became increasingly wary of church splits undermining evangelistic cooperation. Ockengay's ministry was more deliberate than most. He wanted to change the way gospel-believing people thought and acted. He had a vision for reform, and it was a vision that required prayer, gospel preaching, and orthodox doctrine. But he also wanted to advance his troika of concerns regarding social engagement, improved scholarship, and stronger associations among believers to facilitate many good endeavors. The label that he created to describe this multi-part package has endured. He called his movement Neo-Evangelicalism, or the New Evangelicalism. For he considered his reform of 20th century fundamentalism to be in reality a return to the heyday of 19th century evangelicalism. Well, many books would be needed to capture the full scope of Gay's efforts. And the handful of studies on my desk just scratched the surface. But four features of his movement-forming mission stand out. Ockengay first stressed foreign missions. He turned down that posh Seattle church because of the effort he was putting into a Park Street missions conference. He wanted to be a foreign missionary at one time, but was persuaded he could do more sending missionaries than as one being sent. Well, having made that decision, he wanted to make good on it. And in a matter of 10 years... With God's blessing, Park Street's giving to foreign missions grew by 75 times, with most of that giving coming from people of modest means. Second, Ockengay organized evangelistic outreach and prayed for revival. As he saw in his own day what he considered to be the greatest ever revival in New England with the help of Billy Graham. Even before Billy Graham had drawn national attention, Ockengay was renting uh, facilities, larger and larger venues in Boston to host the evangelists and the crowds for which they prayed. The numbers did grow large, and the revivals grew longer than Ockengay could have hoped. On one occasion alone, 16,000 came to hear, with more than 12,000 turned away. The Crusades doubled as an opportunity to raise awareness about societal and political issues. Ockengay would often open an evening by preaching against communism after Graham would preach the gospel. You know, just like they do at T4G and other places. <laughs> with a local newspaper magnet, with a local, local uh, newspaper magnate giving the event detailed and continuous coverage, 
These Boston revivals played a major part of, of Graham's growing fame and effectiveness. In the third place, Ockengay spared no effort to connect ministers and scholars in New England with one another. He was part of every important endeavor, often behind each important endeavor, to schedule dinners, meetings, conferences, colloquia of all sorts. Eventually, he helped to form the National Association of Evangelicals and served as its first president. The NAE united over shared commitment to scripture, evangelism, and social concern, could offer a space for joint efforts while avoiding the problems of doctrinally indifferent church mergers. It, it, could, have, it could avoid what he came to see as unnecessary church separation. Indeed, it was hoped that the NAE could be popular both with fundamentalists and doctrinal conservatives in mainline denominations. His fourth major effort was to increase the quality of Christian scholarship. Ockengay formed a Bible school based at Park Street that taught hundreds of people per week. For a time, he joined Carl Henry in attempting to start Crusade University. A crusade was to be a high-flying institution better than any Christian college in America and funded by Graham supporters like Rockefeller Jr. Well, that idea fizzled, and not because anyone thought that Crusade University was a problematic name and a, about as useful as like Colonialism University or something like that. Well, as it happened, Fuller Seminary, Fuller Theological Seminary, looked to be Ockengay's true academic success story. Fuller existed because Ockengay had persuaded an evangelist by that name that the West Coast needed a seminary that could replace the East Coast's Princeton. Fuller would be the place where evangelicals could be trained and sent into fundamentalist churches and into the mainline denominations of America. It could reverse the decline of orthodoxy. Fuller's earlier faculty, his early faculty, many of them recruited personally by Ockengay from that, that circle of, of, of people about whom Nathan Finn spoke moments ago, uh, Fuller's early faculty drew heavily from uh, the Boston area in particular. Uh, these were among the finest of fundamentalists turned evangelicals. And the initial round of professors was fully committed to the inerrancy and inspiration of Scripture. Now, so far, this talk has probably felt like a belated public relations effort for Ockengay. Uh, for most of us, the forgotten father of mid-20th century evangelicalism. But I would not be a helpful or honest historian if I didn't try and distinguish this morning between the Ockengay of the extraordinary ministry, often drawn to what Greg Gilbert in this conference has called the broad mission of the church, and the Ockengay of ordinary ministry, what Greg has helpfully called the narrow ministry of the church. One can see a variety of broad missions talk in the way in which Ockengay spoke about revival. Millions of Americans believe an old-fashioned spiritual revival could preserve our God-given freedoms and way of life, Ockengay explained. And that's true. Many Americans did and do believe this, and it accounts for the non-evangelical support of evangelistic crusades. But would it not have been better for my brother in heaven to help American Christians, especially those who are trying to love God before country, to see that their freedoms and way of life ought to make space for the mission of Christ church rather than the success of Christ church serving for the good of our freedoms. Yes, there's a sense in which we can speak of a revival preserving or a church serving a city or a nation. It can do so in terms of direct spiritual good or indirect temporal good. But we should be very clear, as Ockengay was often but not always clear, about what we mean if we're going to use that kind of language. And I think we'll always mix our messaging when we express hopes that a good revival can revive an American way of life. Ockengay did not want mixed messaging, but his attempts to address social and political issues did sometimes confuse categories. 
convinced as we all should be that Scripture speaks to all issues and that politics is an issue. He spoke of America as having a divine mission to oppose communism, thus using language reserved for God's kingdom and applying it to a kingdom of this world. He also publicly opposed not just Roman Catholicism in general, but the presidential campaign of Kennedy in particular, calling people to get behind particular politicians as a matter of Christian principle when he could have been teaching them to think biblically about matters of Christian prudence. At other times, Ockengay focused on the narrow ministry of the church, but was in a rush to find broad support. For example, the revivals with Graham started strong. There was a massive response to their preaching, which looks to me like a profound work of the Holy Spirit. Nonetheless, Graham and Ockingay soon courted sponsorships for their crusades with both evangelical and mainline pastors willing to fund Graham's crusades. It's true, crusade staff and volunteers followed up with fresh, edifying evangelical literature and they would correspond with new converts. But they were also required to recommend new converts without bias to supporting churches, both evangelical and not. And in those crusades that were heavily supported by progressive churches, that was a ministry of evangelism at the expense of a ministry of discipleship. Finally, Ockengay and the faculty first appointed for Fuller Seminary had an almost fatal attraction to what George Marsden aptly labels brand name religion. These new evangelicals wanted the old evangelical influence on the grand old denominations of America. Instead of accepting that sometimes evangelicals are a pilgrim people, that we swim in the eddies and not with the mainstream. While serving as first president of Fuller, all the way from Boston, the desperation of Ockingay and his friends to see graduates accepted by mainline Presbyterian, by the mainline Presbyterian church, led him to hire a, a known Bardian with the hope of impressing the progressives. When that didn't work, when these types of efforts failed to impress the mainline churches, Some faculty then tried to curry favor with their enemies by criticizing their fundamentalist allies. Ockengay started those things, even though he didn't like where it led. But to his credit, and by God's grace, he started over when he needed to. He could correct his course. As more fuller faculty offered a less consistent witness to the truths of Scripture, Ockengay first decided to write the introduction to a former Fuller Seminary's work, Professor Harold Linzel's Explosive Battle for the Bible, a book which contained an extensive expose of the teaching of his former colleagues at Fuller Seminary. And then Ockengay helped to found and serve as the first president of Gordon Conwell Seminary, in the greater Boston area. The new seminary was a tremendous success, once more attracting leading scholars and hundreds of students. And Ockengay learned a lesson. The new seminary was open to, welcome to, but not equally oriented around acceptance by mainline denominations and the compromises that could foreseeably come from such a preoccupation. If Ockengay's weaker moments attended his extraordinary ministry, his strongest moments were attached to his energetic pursuit of an ordinary pastoral life and ministry and the narrower mission of the church. I think it's this powerful use of the ordinary means that, that had the most impact, impact for, for, for good on his own generation and maybe on ours through men like John Piper and Wayne Grudem and others who are deeply influenced and impacted by this powerful preacher of old. The first of these ordinary features of his life and ministry is his faithfulness. Ockengay lived coram Deo, and then he died in the faith in which he was raised, still married to the woman who had supported him through all his trials and adventures. 
He finished his long ministry praying to the same Father, preaching the same Christ, trusting in the same Spirit with whom he began, even when it came at the cost of relationships or institutions that he had fostered and loved. He was faithful. And by God's grace, that's the kind of faithfulness we too can pursue with the Holy Spirit's help. In the second place, he did not minister with the handicap of a hero complex. He learned from, worked with others. Not only men with Machen and, and Carl Henry and Graham, who, who he could see as great men, but with many ordinary men, with an army of mentors and friends and allies. He was collegial and cooperative and could do more because of it. And we too, as we band together with the Holy Spirit's help, can multiply our strength in holding out the gospel for our generation. And he was full of God's word and preached it fearlessly. His preaching portrays the horrors of human sin, presents the truth of hell's terrors, and preaches Christ as an all-sufficient substitute and sacrifice. Listen to his treatment, which you can find online, of Jesus as a carpenter's son. You'll hear a stirring call to see the goodness of work. Hear his sermon on the death penalty, and it will lead you to the one who took for us the penalty of sin. Even his topical sermons are reflective of God's words. God's word and all his sermons reveal a man utterly convinced of the authority of that word. He was a pastor who knew and loved his Bible and sought to preach the whole counsel of God. And we too, with God's help, can love this book better and preach it more faithfully. And he was a man who in spite of his advocacy of a cultural mission for the church, did more than most in his day to promote a gospel mission for his church. Organizing conferences, sending countless missionaries, and encouraging missionaries in their work. We too can foster in Christ's people, with Christ's help, a commitment to his commission, with his blessing. In 1985, Ronald Reagan, a dream for conservative churchmen like Okengay, was in the middle of his presidency. But as he lay dying from cancer in 1985, this didn't matter anymore to Ockingay, who asked the elders from Park Street Church to come and anoint him with oil and pray for him. Garth Rossell's account of this last visit tells us that one elder after another tried to comfort the dying man by reminding him of all that he had done. You can... See why they'd try to do so. Because in retrospect, Ockingay's accomplishments are truly astounding. He was an early leader or founder of almost every significant evangelical institution in the two decades after World War II. He was a tireless advocate of the life of the evangelical mind. And the eventual placement of evangelical scholars in secular institutions owes much under God to Ockingay. His work as a preacher, as a, as a leader of two new academic institutions, has no obvious parallel in the middle of the 20th century. But of course, that's not how you comfort a preacher of the gospel who believes the gospel for himself. And so after all the other elders had spoken, one more old friend leaned over Ockingay and said quietly, well, Harold... I suggest that when you see the master, just say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And at this, the tears began to flow as the dying pastor was directed to his risen Savior. May God help us to be faithful, to work together, to trust the scriptures, to promote and to preach the mission of our all-sufficient Savior. Let's pray together now that he would help us in these things. Our good and faithful God, our Father, we come to you this morning with hearts so filled with gratitude for who you are and for what you've done in your church in the past. We thank you, Father, for, for men like Harold John Ockingay who preached your word so fervently for so many years and was used to raise up new generations of preachers. Father, would you use ordinary men like ourselves in extraordinary ways? We dare to ask this 
because we come to you trusting in the mighty power of your spirit, and because we come to you in the name of an all-sufficient Savior. Will you do these things? We know that you will, because we ask them in the name of your Son. Amen.